Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear sisters and brothers. Welcome to Cambridge Muslim College's Quran Healing Series. We're going to just give it a few more minutes for everybody to join us, inshallah. We'll be starting at five after, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, dear sisters and brothers, to the Cambridge Muslim College's Ramadan series, Understanding the Quran. Inshallah, we're going to be picking up from the conversation on finding healing through the Quran. The Cambridge Muslim College, we hope, inshallah, is going to become one of your, um, you are going to become one of its patrons, one of its friends and supporters, inshallah ta'ala. It is a registered charity, and we hope, inshallah, that this series you find beneficial and that you're able to support us. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Today, inshallah, we're going to discuss stories of healing from the Quran, specifically from Surah Yusuf. Surah Yusuf is a beautiful surah in the Quran, and it's a surah that Pretty much the entire surah is a story. It is the story of Sayyidina Yaqub, alayhi salam, his son, Sayyidina Yusuf, their siblings, and also stories of many different characters that emerge in the story. And in it, there are many trials, lots of tribulation, lots of tests, and a good bit of healing that happens as well. So let us focus our attention, inshallah ta'ala, today on the surah, on Surah Yusuf. I'm going to start, inshallah, from early in the surah, in which one of the very first stories that emerge is a story of betrayal. And betrayal is very difficult. Probably one of the most difficult tests there are that a person can endure. Betrayal can even be more painful 
when it comes at the hands of the people who are closest to you, your friends and your family members, people that you've entrusted. In Sayyidina Yusuf's story in the Quran, we see, subhanAllah, an incredible guidance for trials that involve immense pain that people endure, we as humans endure. Betrayal, slander, persecution. His story has so many layered, complex levels of trials. And so I'll begin, inshallah, in a discussion from where Sayyidina Yusuf is cast into the well by his very own brothers, his brothers who are given the responsibility to take care of him, to protect him. For many of us, this is an incredible amount of pain to even imagine or understand. It's the pain of being hurt at the hands of the people you've been entrusted to. When a person has been betrayed in this way, they can have feelings of hurt, anger, confusion, even depression and clinical trauma. When a person has experienced this level of betrayal, it is really hard. It can be very difficult to rebuild a sense of trust again. And it could take a really long time to forgive or to move on. In the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, one of the longest parts of the story, we start to think that maybe the brothers of Sayyidina Yusuf got away. They're not mentioned again for a very long time in the story. And as you go through the Sura and you're reading the different parts of it, you may actually think maybe they got away with their wrongdoings. But Allah Azza wa Jal proves this in, as the story goes on in the Sura that actually it's in the favor of Sayyidina Yusuf and nobody gets away with any deeds, good or bad. And you see here, subhanAllah, Sayyidina Yusuf is honored. Eventually, as we go through the story, he becomes the ruler of the land. And we'll talk about this in more detail momentarily. And it's at this point that you see that he's reunited with his brothers who ask him for forgiveness. And that they repent to Allah Azza wa Jal for what they've done. And it's years, years later. Now, Sayyidina Yusuf this entire time has been dealing with the betrayal of his brothers, as is his father, Sayyidina Yaqub, who we'll also talk about momentarily. And it's incredible to see what happens in the exchange between Sayyidina Yusuf and his brothers in this moment where they realize how wrong they have been. And it was not early on that they came to this realization. Sometimes a person who's been so betrayed and hurt has asked themselves, doesn't this person who's, who did the harm to them understand what they've done to me? Can't they know? Don't they see? And sometimes people don't see. They can't understand the amount of harm that's happened. And you see this with very good people like the brothers of Sayyidina Yusuf who did this in, in their young years, right? But it was still very harmful and the results are incredibly uh, traumatic but it takes them a while. And in this moment where they come to this realization of, oh, we have really messed up here. And you know that it's taken them a while because all along their father, Sayyidina Yaqub, has been crying, has been depressed, has been really down, grieving for the loss of his son, Sayyidina Yusuf. And this entire time, his sons, his family are telling him, are you going to keep on remembering Yusuf until you go senile? And he has to say, enough of this. But when they reunite, when they're reunited with Sayyidina Yusuf, they realize how much they wronged him. And they ask for his forgiveness. And here we see a choice, a choice that happens where Sayyidina Yusuf can choose, just like any one of us who's been betrayed or hurt, in some way, we can choose to forgive, or we can choose not to forgive. And there are many people, especially in my world of mental health and in counseling and in therapy, this question of forgiveness comes up, up again and again and again. And it never is to diminish the harm 
that a person that has hurt you, humiliated, perpetrated against you has done. But it's a real question of, do I have to forgive? And we learn in this deen of ours of Islam, you don't have to forgive, but it is better. And people say, but that person and all the harm they did, and it is true, all the harm they did, and not minimizing in any way. We see some amazing stories and we've witnessed, you and I have witnessed stories in which a person has literally murdered their own, uh, murdered uh, uh, their child. There's a murderer who's killed their child and the person is standing in court, that parent is standing in court in front of their child's murderer and saying to them, I choose to forgive you. It's incredible. It takes immense human willpower and strength to be able to do that when you know that that person has perpetrated against you or your loved one. And it's not one story or two stories, it's multiple stories, often at the hands of Muslims who are saying, my religion taught me to forgive, even for murder. Yet it is a choice. And it's important to say here that when we choose to forgive, we forgive for our own mental and emotional well-being, not for that other person. That other person is going to stand trial on the day of judgment with Allah Azza wa Jal alone. And as believers and only believers understand that there is a judgment day, that there is an akhirah coming and that person will be held account. And Allah will not let anything slide. And that helps us reach a point of resolution of our own intense and real hurt and emotion and make a decision, a choice on whether to forgive or not. But again, choosing to forgive is for us because that person has their lore to stand in front of. But all of the emotional tension and bitterness and angst is only hurting us at the end of the day. Forgiveness, especially in light of betrayal, is sometimes one of the most difficult things to come to terms with. To understand that Allah Azza wa Jal will actually always work in our favor. If you have been harmed, if you are the one that this has been done to, then Allah is going to always help you out. When we harbor ill feelings, bitter feelings, and so on, it eats just away at us, ultimately. And of course, of course, of course, we must take the necessary measures to protect ourselves that any of this harm of the betrayal posed, not minimizing that in any way either. As we go back to understanding and looking at the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, you realize more and more that Allah Azza wa Jal was in control of everything the entire time. Even though the story takes twists and turns and goes into different converse, different parts of his life, it is amazing actually. And we realize that sometimes we just don't know or we're limited in what we can comprehend in that moment. But later things might become much more clear for us because Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran وَكَذَلِكَ مَكَّنَّا لِيُوسُفَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلِنُعَلِّمَهُ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَاللَّهُ غَالِبٌ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِ وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ and we've established Yusuf in the land to teach him the true meanings of events and Allah was in control of his affair However, most of mankind, humankind, do not know. That's powerful. It's reminding us that Allah is always in control, even when we feel like things are going out of control and not in our control. It's in Allah's control, Azza wa Jal. And there are meanings to every test, to every trial, to every tribulation. The verses in the Quran are a healing to us. When we understand this, when we end up having certainty, yaqeen, in the presence of Allah Azza wa Jal and in his plan, we then understand that the only way we can have control 
is understanding that Allah is the one who is in control. And what we're in control of is how we choose to respond to the trials, the tribulations, the tests that come our way. That Allah Azza wa Jal will never forsake us. He's never going to lead us astray. He will always lay the pieces of the puzzles in a way that is more befitting than we could ever have possibly imagined. We're trying to fit the puzzle pieces in all these ways, but the way Allah Azza wa Jal has ordained for the puzzle pieces to fit is the best way and better than we can ever have possibly imagined. The glue for all these pieces is our iman. It's our faith. And the more faith that we have in Allah's way, his wisdom, his, his decisions, and the more that we strengthen our du'as, the more the glue is strengthened and allow us to stand our ground whenever tribulations hit. And this is probably a good time as any to talk about du'a. Du'a. You see, Dua is something that this month of Ramadan is a month of Qur'an and a month of Dua. Another thing that we see very often in the story of Sayyidina Yusuf is how much Dua he makes and how much Dua his father Sayyidina Yaqub makes over and over again. Another element that we see very often in the surah, there is a specific item that shows up again and again in the Surah Yusuf, Surah Yusuf. And that is Surah Yusuf, that is Sayyidina Yusuf salam's shirt. His shirt is mentioned multiple times, in fact, three different times in the Surah. And I'm going to share with you some of the understanding behind the mention of the shirt, because if you follow Sayyidina Yusuf's shirt through the Surah, you start to understand this whole entire surah better. The first time that we see Sayyidina Yusuf's shirt is in the very beginning, the story that we just told about when his brothers cast him into the well. They throw him into the well. They're overpowered by jealousy. They think that his father, their father, Sayyidina Yaqub, is treating Sayyidina Yusuf better than them. They like that he likes him better than them. And it's amazing the power of jealousy, that jealousy can get you to a point where literally you would consider killing someone. And then eventually they can't get themselves to kill him. So they throw him in the well and fake his death. This is why jealousy is one of the worst sins and one of the worst diseases of the heart that must be cleansed and worked on because this is literally the point that jealousy can lead you to, subhanAllah. And when the brothers come to their father, Sayyidina Yaqub, they bring a shirt, and this is the first time we see a shirt, they take Sayyidina Yusuf's shirt, and they cover it in blood, trying to convince their father that Sayyidina, Yaqub, Sayyidina Yusuf was captured by the wolves and eaten by them. He knows that this is not the case, but Yusuf is gone. The end result is Yusuf is gone. And there is intense hurt, which we'll talk about as well. Now, Sayyidina Yusuf is in the well, and the surah continues and explains that eventually a caravan is passing by this well. They find a boy inside the well, and they say, oh, wow, what is this? And at the time, slavery is something that is commonplace. So they literally take the boy, actually rescue him, but they take the boy and they sell him to whom? To a wealthy Egyptian minister in Egypt, another land, right? And the minister tells his wife, look after this boy and treat him well, because maybe we'll adopt him like a son. In the Quran, it says, وَقَالَ الَّذِي اشْتَرَاهُ مِن مِصْرَ لِمْرَأَتِهِ كِرِمِي مَثْوَى and so the Egyptian, it says, the minister who bought him, told his wife, look after him with honor and with respect. It's possible that he'll be of use to us one day. Perhaps we might adopt him as a son. Interesting, 
right? So here is what happens. He gets, Satan Yusuf is betrayed by his brothers. He's thrown into a well. He's sold into slavery. He's taken to a brand new land. And then he ends up in a decent home, right? The minister of Egypt out of all places. And he's raised there. But when he approaches manhood, the minister's wife, Zuleikha, finds him attractive and becomes very fond of him and wants to seduce him, attempts to seduce him. This is the second time we see Sayyidina Yusuf's shirt come into the picture. And here is where it's important to talk about. This is a verse in the Quran directly, and it speaks to human behavior, human psychology. In psychology, we study human behavior and their cognition and their understanding. And in Islamic psychology, we spend a lot of time understanding the, the pools, the tug of the nafs, a person's self, including their lower base self, and their soul, their ruh, their qalb, their heart, their psyche, their cognition, and in the interplay between all of these and their ihsas, their emotions. And they all affect one another. And to when someone like myself who studies this field reads the Quran, it is so interesting to read about human behavior and also the harms that happen and the healing that happens. It's incredible, actually. Look how the Quran talks about this incident of seduction. Zuleikha approaches Sayyidina Yusuf and he refuses her advances. The Quran says very specifically, though, that he may not have, if it were not for the clear signs that Allah had given him. Why? Because he's human. The best of all humans, the prophets we believe are the best of all humans, but human nevertheless. And the Quran specifically says, وَلَقَدْ هَمَّتْ بِهِ وَهَمَّ بِهَا لَوْ لَا أَرْوَأَ بُرْحَانَ رَبِّهِ كَذَلِكَ لِنَصْرِفَ عَنْهُ السُّوءَ وَالْفَحْشَاءِ إِنَّهُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا الْمُخْلَصِينَ She advances towards him, and he would have done likewise. And he would have done likewise, had he not seen the sign from his Lord. This is how we kept evil and indecency away from him, and truly he was one of our chosen servants. I emphasize this because we're all human at the end of the day. And the rules that our dean has given us put for you clear measures and boundaries of how to interact. Men with women, adults with children, all people with the elderly, it is important to understand that these rules are put in place for protection because Allah knows what he created and he understands the human behaviors that he created. So there are rules in place to help us. But here comes Sayyidina Yusuf again, dealing with another trial because when he refuses Zuleikha, she's upset. And so she accuses him and she makes a false accusation that isn't true. Nothing had actually happened other than her trying to go after him. And here we see Sayyidina Yusuf's shirt come back into the story again for the second time. So interesting. And here Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, through the recommendation that came from one of the members of the household of the minister, Al-Aziz, who says, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُهُ قَدْ قُدَّ مِنْ قُبُلٍ فَصَدَقَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ وَإِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُهُ قَدْ قُدَّ مِنْ دُبُرٍ فَكَذَبَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْصَادِقِينَ so interesting, if the shirt, the, the person from the household of Aziz gives this recommendation and says, if the shirt is torn from the front, then she speaks the truth, and he clearly told a shameless lie. And if the shirt is torn from the back, then she lied, and he cl clearly has told the truth. And with that, you see that Sayyidina Yusuf's innocence is proven by the tear because the tear is on the back of the shirt. 
سبحان الله. But it's heavy. It's heavy. And we know that it doesn't end here because she's not happy with being, you know, put to shame like this. So she concocts an entire plan that eventually leads him to prison, falsely accused, falsely accused. Trials of betrayal, trials of slander. It is so layered in the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, one thing after another, after another, after another. Yet, subhanAllah, you see here that Sayyidina Yusuf remains patient. Later in the story, when Sayyidina Yusuf himself becomes the ruler of the land and has the upper hand, he has a choice to make. They say, exit the prison. And he says, not until my innocence is proven. And when his innocence is proven, he's asked for forgiveness. So another time, Sayyidina Yusuf has asked for forgiveness. And he actually says, I'm going to forgive as long you know, my name is cleared. I'm going to forgive these people, these women. It's very interesting to see that, to see the fact that there is harm and perpetration, but also a sense of being able to forgive. Allah Azza wa Jal puts this in the Quran to teach us. Different parts of the Quran speak to different people. It speaks to the different trials different people in this world are going to deal with. The shirt again, right, comes up again a third time. And this time it's towards the very end of the story when Sayyidina Yusuf is the ruler and has the upper hand and his brothers discover who he is. And they ask for his forgiveness. And as we said, Sayyidina Yusuf forgives them. He chooses to forgive them. And he gives them his shirt. Three times, right? This happens. His shirt shows up. And he says, take my shirt back to my father, their father, Sayyidina Yaqub, and cover his face with it so that his vision can return by Allah's permission. One shirt, three layers of complex trials, tribulations, and healing. Especially in the last time the shirt shows up, actual healing of the eyes, subhanAllah. Resilience. You see that Sayyidina Yusuf's story that he rises from the depth of a dark well, literally, he rises from the depth of darkness of a well. You can't climb out of a well alone. All the way to becoming the ruler of the land. And sometimes in the face of injustice, your nafs, our nafs, it convinces us that injustice has the upper hand, that they're going to get away with it. But no, Allah has wisdom in his plan. And sometimes people are going to face those consequences here in the dunya. And if they don't, it's definitely going to happen in the akhirah. This is what a believer understands. And it eases some of that intense amount of suffering and pain that comes with it. For Sayyidina Yusuf, what you see is unwavering faith in Allah Azza wa Jal. He never questions Allah's will. What you see in his story again and again is patience perseverance despite the immense suffering you know you can read the surah the, and you know in the verses there is immense suffering happening here but there is nothing pushing there he's not pushing back and angry with god despite the suffering you see that he never gives up hope and this is how we define resilience resilience in the face of persecution Resilience in the face of temptation. Resilience in the face of betrayal. Through it all, Sayyidina Yusuf is resolute. He has absolute yaqeen, certainty, that with beautiful patience comes Allah's relief, Azza wa Jal. And beautiful patience is one of the most beautiful parts of the surah. Fasabrun jameel. And that takes us now to Sayyidina Yusuf's father, Sayyidina Yaqub, whom says this phrase twice in the Quran. And it is 
powerful and beautiful. So let's talk about Sayyid Yaqub. Sayyid Yaqub, one of the most um, beautiful things that's mentioned by Allah Azza wa Jalla about him in the Quran, it says, indeed, he was a man of inner strength and utter resoluteness. So like his son, Sayyid Yaqub is a man of inner strength and outer resoluteness. Amazing. Allah Azza wa Jal tests Sayyidina Yaqub in many different ways. The first test that we encounter in the Quran in the Surah is the test of Sayyidina Yaqub losing his son Yusuf alayhi salam. It's a hard test. And for any parent that has lost their child or even almost lost their child, you know how hard this is. People say things like the normal way is for a child to bury their parents, not the other way around. SubhanAllah. It is hard to lose a child. Incredible, incredible test. Sayyidina Yaqub was tested with Sayyidina Yusuf being taken away from him and by and at the hands of his very own brothers whom are still the children of Sayyidina Yaqub, and he's going to interact with them for the rest of their lives and his life too. Layers of difficulty. And Sayyidina Yaqub didn't know his son's whereabouts. He didn't know if he was actually alive or not. He just had faith, belief in Allah that there's going to be a way made for Yusuf and eventually reunited with the family. Not clear if it was in this dunya or in the akhir. But Sayyidina Yaqub had immense faith in God. There are differences of opinion between the scholars of how many years exactly between losing Sayyidina Yusuf as a kid and then eventually being reunited with him years later. What we can definitely say is it was most likely decades. Some say 30 years, some say 40 years. Allahu Adam. Decades. It is an incredibly, incredibly long time to not know whether your child is even alive or dead. Imagine the pain of not just losing your child, but the uncertainty of the test. The uncertainty itself is a test of not knowing. Not knowing. There's no closure. So many people in Gaza and Palestine are feeling this right at this very moment. So many stories are emerging of, we don't know. We don't know. We can't tell. Are they under rubble? Were they taken away? Were they are they dead? And this is where Allah Azza wa Jal gives us this term called beautiful patience. Fasabrun Jamil. Which is interesting because it means if Allah Azza wa Jal is going to put an adjective before the word patience. That means that there are different forms of patience. And this form of patience that Sayyidina Yaqub presents to us is a beautiful patience. The sabrun jameel. It is the kind of patience that's in the face of hardship and adversity. It's a phrase that we say when we have unwavering faith in Allah Azza wa Jal, we trust in his plan, but there are numerous tests that we face. Sayyidina Yaqub never loses hope. He continues to be patient. He is hopeful. So much so that his family around him don't understand him anymore. They just don't get it. And they don't understand why he's crying so much. And he tells them, let me be. I understand from Allah what you don't understand. And eventually he says, or it says in the Quran, وَتَوَلَّا عَنْهُمْ وَقَالَ يَا أَسَفَ عَلَى يُوسُفُ وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمُ Powerful verse. And he turned away from them, meaning his family, and said, Oh, my sorrow over Yusuf. And his eyes became white from grief because he was a suppressor of that grief. SubhanAllah. Now, again, reading from eyes of someone trained in mental health, in my case, a psychiatrist, it is so interesting. Ya Rabbi, 
Allah Azza wa Jal could have described any physical feature of Sayyidina Yaqub. He could have told us his height. He could have told us the color of his hair. He could have told us anything he wanted in the Quran. Instead, he describes his eyes. And here too, the scholars of the Fasirun, the scholars of exegesis in the Quran, differ on exactly what does وَبْيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ mean. The وَبْيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ part literally means his eyes became white. And some people say that it was blindness, and other people say it was more like haziness of vision. Allahu alam, which it was. But the point is that there was a physical manifestation for an emotional state. We call this psychosomatic. It is something that truly you can have a physical symptom emerge from an emotional grief, in this case, that he was holding. From grief is how his eyes became white. Crying, crying, grief, grief. And here too, I'm going to pause and say this. Sayyidina Yaqub is a man. A man who cried. And cried intensely. And Allah describes that in the Quran. Along with describing his beautiful patience. But intense grief to which literally your eyesight is affected. And for long periods of time. In our cultures... So many of us tell our boys, don't cry, be a man, man up. And we tell our men, if you cry, that shows you're weak. You're not allowed to do such a thing. Until literally their hearts, their hearts harden. You have examples in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us examples directly in the Quran of the most the most perfect of all humans that existed, the prophets. And here is Sayyidina Yaqub crying as a man, and Allah chooses to show this to us and show us what grief can actually look like and what healing can look like. Sayyidina Yaqub, throughout this grief, has immense patience and trust in Allah. And he knows that this will ultimately pay off, either reuniting with Sayyidina Yusuf in this dunya or in the akhirah. How many times have we heard people shame us or others for displaying sadness, for having prolonged periods of grief, as though grief isn't a core part of so many of the stories of so many of the prophets? SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah, take a look at the Prophet Muhammad himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It is beautiful to learn directly from the seerah, from the best of all of the examples. There's a story in which the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has his son, Ibrahim, in his lap. And Ibrahim is taking his very last breaths. He's dying. And the Prophet وسلم, starts to tear up. He's shedding tears. And one of the Sahabi who sees this, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, says to him, Oh Rasulullah, even you cry? As in to say, Is it okay to cry? Is it okay that we cry? Right? They're learning directly the lived example of this Qur'an, the lived example of Islam itself embodied as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you know what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says? Ya ibn Awfin, innaha rahmatun. Oh, Ibn Awf, this is a mercy. And then he said, and then he looks down at his son and says, 
وَإِنَّ بِفِرَاقِقَ يَا إِبْرَاهِيمُ لَمَحْزُونُونَ The Prophet wasallam said to Abdurrahman ibn Awf, Oh ibn Awf, this is a mercy. And then he cried more. And then he said, The eyes shed tears. And the heart is grieved. But we do not say that which except which pleases our Lord. And looks at his son and says, Oh Ibrahim, Indeed, we are grieved by your separation. Powerful and important. This is our Prophet wasallam. This is our religion. This is our deen. This is a religion that understands human emotion and human behavior and puts rail guards in place to make sure we don't go into extremes. We don't wail and scream and carry on. But also that doesn't suffocate and minimize and shame emotions, sadness, weakness, tears, crying. This is what Allah has created, all emotions. There is no good emotions and bad emotions. Happiness and, 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 and gladness is good and grief and crying and sadness is bad. No, no. The whole spectrum of emotions is what Allah has created. They're all his creation. And he's given us the rail guards to figure out how to make sure we don't go past that. But we should never shame. We learn from the story of Sayyidina Yaqub that sadness, grief, crying is not something that you're weak for doing. And it's not because you have low iman or poor belief in Allah Azza wa Jalla that you cry in this way. No. As a believer, expressing and feeling sadness doesn't make you any less of a Muslim. In fact, like our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, it is a mercy. It is the sign of a beating heart. In our cultures, we deaden people's hearts by the shame and the ugly things that we say. This is not the way of our Prophet وسلم, nor the example that we see in the Quran. As Muslims, we know that we don't glorify grief, we don't succumb to it. But like the Prophet Ya'qub we channel our grief as what? We channel it into an opportunity to turn to Allah Azza wa Jal for a deeper, greater connection with Him, to ask Him for guidance. Because surely with beautiful patience comes a beautiful reward. And that is how the story of Sayyidina Yaqub ends. And the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, the whole surah ends with this triumphant return to Egypt where they're all reunited together. Sayyidina Yusuf, his father, all of his siblings, they're reunited again. And Sayyidina Yusuf becomes this powerful ruler in the court of the Pharaoh. And even though it's years between them, years and years have passed, the brothers reconcile. Sayyidina Yaqub's vision is restored by Allah's permission. And Sayyidina Yusuf is honored. As I close here in these reminders of healing, I want to remind you that the timing of when each surah is revealed is also just as important as the verses within them. There is a wisdom or hikmah of the nuzul, meaning when verses of the Quran are revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And in case you didn't know, Sayyidina Yusuf's story, Surat Yusuf, is revealed to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam in a time in which the Prophet himself is going through immense trials and tribulations of his own, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a time in which there is immense persecution of the Muslims, the early Muslims. Quraysh is literally trying to kill them. There is a harsh economic boycott that leaves so many Muslims with irrevocable physical deteriorations and even death. And eventually this boycott eventually also catches up with Sayyidah Khadija 
the wife of the Prophet وسلم, and she dies. And in the midst of all this period, his uncle, who was not a Muslim, but his protector, his ally, the person who kept Quraysh off his back, also dies. And soon after, there is Ba'if, the experience, the very difficult, where the Prophet وسلم, speaks about this later, much later in his life, saying that it was the most difficult day of his life. And in this period, Allah Azza wa Jal reveals to the Prophet Muhammad Surat Yusuf and shows him the many, many, many tests that Sayyidina Yusuf and Sayyidina Yaqub go through. And in it, there is a healing, a healing to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a healing to all the believers, the early Muslims whose steadfastness allow us today to call ourselves Muslim. And an immense healing in the term that we now all use, fasabrun jameel, and beautiful patience, and beautiful patience. May Allah Azza wa Jal allow us, me and you and our families and our sisters and brothers across the ummah to truly embody what it means to have a beautiful patience and to be from those who are practicing a beautiful patience. بارك الله فيكم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على الهادي محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين إن شاء الله we can take some questions in the time that we have remaining بارك الله فيكم بسم الله let's take a look at some of these questions and thank you so much for engaging on the YouTube channel about uh, the concepts that we talked about today. Ya Allah. All right. One of the questions here says, can I speak further on what it means for Sayyidina Yusuf to be chosen by Allah? How can as a lay Muslim we know if he is chosen or favored, how can we know that we are favored by chosen by Allah Azza wa Jal? There's a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in which he says that if you are trialed, that if Allah, excuse me, if Allah Azza wa Jal wishes for you good, he gives you trials. And when a person hears this, they might think how counterintuitive. <laughs> Why would somebody be tested and go through difficulty if Allah wants good for them? And this is the story of Sayyidina Yusuf, the story of Sayyidina Muhammad, in fact, the story of all the prophets in the Qur'an. They all go through so many trials and other and very and other very important people in the Qur'an who will come to, inshallah, in some of our upcoming sessions. And each one of them is trialed. It goes through tribulations. And you have to think of it as, even in trauma, in psychiatry, psychology, we talk about trauma being this very difficult um, experience a person goes through. And there is such a thing called traumatic growth. That after a person experiences such trials and tribulations, such trauma, that they can grow. Doors open in ways that weren't open before to that person. So how do you know you're chosen? <laughs> like Or favored, I guess I should say, by Allah. He's going to send us tests. And he says this in the Quran that he's going to test us. And it's not sufficient that we just say we believe, but rather it's important for us to understand that even after saying we believe there's going to be tests and trials and the akhirah is where things are all peaceful and calm and there are no more issues or tests or trials. But in this dunya, tests and trials are fair game. And depending how we choose <laughs> to deal with them is how we're rewarded. And so, I hope that helps kind of put things into perspective a little bit more. Allah Azza wa Jalla with tests and trials, he polishes us. He polishes us. He polishes us. He polishes us until we're ready for Jannah, quite literally. This is how you know you're favored and chosen, not just because of the trials that come your way, but also the ilham or the gift Allah gives you of knowing how to deal with the trials. And this is what so much of our guidance in the Qur'an 
teaches us, alhamdulillah. Another question asks, being amongst those who God chooses or loves carries a lot of weight and responsibility, but he also protects us from loss of faith. Is that a right thing to say? Absolutely. Right on, spot on. It is a lot of weight and a lot of responsibility. But is there protection? Yes. And that protection can come in the form, so many forms. It can come in the, in the form of um, your own inner strength. It could come in the form of external help. And this is not an issue for us as Muslims. And I talk about this so often. Help comes internal and external. You see this in the life of the Prophet wasallam. You see his own inner strength and you see, say, the Khadija and Abu Talib helping him, right? And all the other companions that kind of all together, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, right? Sayyidina Ali hiding in his bed. I mean, you, you see so many people coming together externally to support and help. You also have to know that in our modern era, that reaching out for help and support externally is also a way of protecting your sanity, your emotions, and your faith. To talk through some of these things with somebody who's knowledgeable might be very, very important. Our spiritual guides and those who are professionally trained are very important in helping us get through things that weigh heavily on us, inshallah. There's a question here that I think is quite interesting too, and it says, in Western therapy, anger is said to be a secondary emotion. What is the purpose? What purpose does our anger serve, if any? Is it a defense? Excellent question. And anger has its place. Um, and it's a real emotion and behavior, just like we talked about the other emotions and behavior we talked about today. And subhanAllah, the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, addresses anger directly. And in this hadith, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says that anger is from shaitan, and shaitan is from fire, teaching us that you put out fire with coolness. And so he says, have them go wash, have them go make wudu, have them go wash up, right? Right? And, and to teaches us, if you're standing, sit. And if you're sitting, lay down. Literally behavioral activation is what we would call it today in our field. And he taught us this, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, himself. And it's interesting how we understand anger or really any other behavior in modern psychology doesn't always align with how it's understood in Islamic psychology. There is actually some purpose to anger, especially if it kind of helps you kind of get up and move up and kind of sparks you to go do something or protect something or someone or get into that, what we call essentially like a fight or flight mode of being able to kind of like push you forward. And anger in, in large quantities is very harmful and problematic and must receive anger therapy, basically behavioral change in activation to support it and to help you minimize it, to hone it, to harness it, and only be able to channel it for good things, right? Not for harm for all people around you, because it will actually eat at you and harm everybody else around you too. So it's important to understand that there are differences in how we understand things. It doesn't always align perfectly with modern, uh, in this case, you called it Western therapy. Um, Part of the work that we do in Islamic psychology in Cambridge Muslim College has an Islamic psychology uh, diploma. And part of the things that we teach in that diploma is um, really to understand where you can filter things coming from Western therapy that are useful and take what's useful from it, but also be able to filter out what is not. So you don't go to the extreme like our professor, Dr. Malik Badri, rahimahullah, who was our mentor, myself, my own mentor, and Dr. Abdullah Rahman is as well. You don't throw out the baby, like he used to say in his books, Professor Malik Badri, don't throw out the baby with the dirty bath water, but don't also keep the baby and the dirty bath water. Figure out what you can retain and what needs to be filtered out and is not useful to us. And figure out what our dean says of itself and needs to be brought in and integrated into modern psychology today, inshallah ta'ala. With that, inshallah, we're going to need to come to a close. And I hope, inshallah, this has been useful to you. 
I pray inshallah that this is um, this whole series you find healing gotta be in it and please inshallah remember that we are going to be live with this session uh, healing in the Quran every Friday so please mark your calendars and tell your friends and family members for the next couple of Fridays as well at Ramadan and that every day of Ramadan at this time 5 p.m. GMT that there are scholars from Cambridge Muslim College who are doing uh, a series every single day of the week. So please tune in to them every day, inshallah. And please don't forget CMC from your generous donations. Barakallahu feekum. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ma'ala al-hadhi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'in. Take good care. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.